It's an honor and a privilege uh, to present uh, new advances in electrical neural imaging to the uh, G20 summit. This is on the subsection of the, G the G20 summit this day on actually November 22nd, 2020, in which a variety of uh, important issues in neuroscience are, are being presented for the leaders of uh, the world actually to uh, consider to uh, in order to address new challenges that are facing uh, so many people in the world today. Uh, this uh, presentation uh, concerns electrical neural imaging, that is the EEG that you measure from the scalp surface. The brain weighs about uh, three pounds, consumes 20, 20 to 40 percent of our blood glucose, and uh, that energy, disproportionate energy, uh, is used to produce electricity that can be measured at the scalp surface by which large groups of neurons talk to each other and communicate to give rise to the mental world we all experience uh, and our ability to move, think, hear, etc. Uh, it, I was a project manager at the National Institutes of Health in the early 1990s at the beginning of the Human Brain uh, Project. In that decade, uh, over $2 billion of taxpayer money went into the development of new imaging methods and the co-registration of those imaging methods. Uh, for example, uh, PET scans, uh, functional MRI, uh, SPEC, uh, quantitative uh, MRI or structural MRI, uh, EEG, and magnetic encephalography were all uh, co-registered. Uh, and uh, in the beginning of the decade of the 1990s, we discovered uh, using a common coordinate system that the brain is actually organized in a small set, a relatively small set of hubs or clusters. Even though there's 100 billion neurons, there's approximately 120 roughly uh, subsets of clusters of, of groups of uh, billions of neurons that become active as subgroups and communicate uh, at the varying uh, rates depending upon their distance and conduction velocities and, and things that allow these clusters to be connected. For example, there's clusters of neurons in the visual cortex for, for vision or the auditory cortex for, for hearing or the motor cortex for movement or frontal lobes for planning, etc. All of these hubs talk to each other and, and the EEG and MEG are unique in the ability to measure at, at very high uh, time domain. Uh, for example, one millisecond or, or even faster, uh, whereas a, a, a PET scanner takes 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, a functional MRI is um, you know, 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, so a very high speed measurement is only available with EEG and MEG. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate in the 1990s that one can uh, uh, evaluate the sources of the EEG by measuring the elect electricity at the scalp surface and co-register those sources with uh, changes in blood flow, for example, that are seen by the PET scan. So when neurons get active, they create demand for blood. Uh, that change in the blood flow is seen in functional MRI and PET scans. But the important thing is the localization of those sources uh, it can be verified and cross-validated with other imaging modalities. So at National Institutes of Health, Health I was also part of the team that did the co-registration uh, evaluation of different imaging modalities. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of what came out of uh, the first uh, decade, the second decade, another $2 billion was uh, developed or spent, and then a third, another $2 billion approximately, and today this is continuing. Uh, the application of this knowledge has accumulated and is a, a considerable benefit to society today. This is an example of how that, that knowledge does benefit individuals. This is a software program that's readily available. Uh, over 3,000 people uh, use uh, this software, or uh, these are primarily psychiatrists, neurologists, clinical psychologists, neuropsychologists, uh, healthcare professionals, to image the brain of patients who have mental health disorders such as attention problems, memory problems, anxiety problems, uh, Parkinsonism, uh, movement disorders, etc., and then link those symptoms to dysregulation in the brain networks and hubs uh, that were have been elaborated extensively in the scientific literature. The co-registration of these imaging modalities is seen in the rotating uh, images at the bottom of this uh, uh, present screen here. Now, what's an important factor that's driving the emergency, emerging and emergency 
the state that we're in today is uh, in the uh, demand on uh, helping people with mental health disorders. Uh, this slide was by, created by Dr. Katev and presented yes, at yesterday's uh, G20 summit. And uh, there, for example, in 2014, there's 1,500,000 traumatic brain injured patients. Uh, and then there's uh, numerous people with strokes, uh, 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 Parkinson's disorders, uh, uh, attention de deficit disorders, epilepsy, et cetera, that are a, a small number of which are listed uh, to the right. And $780 billion uh, was uh, is, is, the debil is estimated the debilitating cost of these disorders. But this has been compounded by the COVID virus that we're uh, facing today in which the sequelae following the uh, ability to uh, survive the virus has given rise to a, a quite a large number of uh, mental health problems and brain uh, uh, dysregulations that can be uh, measured today. And uh, now that we have the ability to measure in such uh, exquisite detail, both in time and space, the sources of the EEG compare those uh, sources to a healthy normal uh, a population from birth to 82 years of age. For example, we use one that's FDA registered, containing individuals selected that are healthy, uh, no history of neurological disorders. And it's similar to a blood test in that uh, like, uh, you can evaluate the hematocrits or white blood cell count or cholesterol with respect to a, a reference population. So that way individuals, the doctor can identify uh, the uh, the. the, the either too much or too little of some of these constituents in the blood and then devise a uh, treatment to move the individual in the direction of the healthy, normal uh, reference population. The same is done with uh, you know, quantitative EEG. Another thing that we discovered at the National Institutes of Health when I was part of the, uh, 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 the multimodal registration and the 128 channel project manager uh, was that the, uh, the resolution of the accuracy of source localization is relatively independent of the number of sensors on the scalp surface. Uh, that's important because uh, it's the more sensors, the more expensive uh, and the more complicated and the more time it takes to put these sensors on the scalp surface. Now, this is a simulation, a mathematical simulation, uh, looking at uh, the accuracy of sources on the left column is uh, sources from the thalamus, uh, bilateral thalamus in the right column is the same uh, sources from the thalamus, but in addition, a right occipital source, that's where the visual cortex is. Uh, so those are the two columns. And you can see the relative accuracy of source localization for 19 channels is just slightly less accurate than 128 channels. And then the magnetic electroencephalography also uh, is uh, similar uh, accuracy. Uh, the, Important difference is that a 19 channel EEG amplifier costs anywhere from $800 to $3,000. Uh, a 128 channel EEG is somewhere between $100 and $150,000. And a uh, 148 channel MEG is $2 million. So, and it's some of these are just simply not as practical and can't not be distributed as widely uh, as the 19 channel system can to have a real impact on our society. As a consequence, we're putting together this uh, a, a concept of being able to uh, uh, do scanning a bit of a large number of individuals inexpensively. That is to measure the EEG and, uh, and send that to a uh, over the cloud to be evaluated to for early detection of mental health disorders to identify uh, the dysregulation in brain networks and hubs and then devise treatments. In this case, the hub itself is the quantitative EEG with three-dimensional imaging uh, with one millisecond or 10 millisecond resolution uh, at very high speed. And the spokes are the different treatment modalities. Uh, for example, at the top, there's neurofeedback. That's a biofeedback. That's a method that has been used for a number of decades uh, uh, to change the number and size of synapses, the molecular mechanisms by which the number and size of synapses changed was elucidated by Eric Kandel, who's on the board of the Society of Brain Mapping and Therapeutics, along with myself and, and the others that are presenting here at the, the G20 conference. In addition, there's a, a direct a cortical stimulation of various types. 
uh, and a photo uh, uh, biomodulation uh, to enhance ATP and uh, met metabolic functioning, uh, medications, of course, and then uh, psychotherapy and neuropsych evaluations. But uh, having the brain as the hub, because that's the organ that's responsible for the symptoms. And to the extent one can move the, uh, the, the uh, communication uh, dynamics of uh, the brain towards a healthier state, then the severity of the symptoms go down. And now we can measure that quantitatively and uh, then give feedback to clinicians as to the efficacy of the treatments. This is one way we can do that using today now smartphones and, and iPhone or, I, or Android, for example, to uh, do uh, self-report questionnaires. Uh, to look at the severity of various symptoms, such as attention problems, addiction problems, anxiety problems, uh, movement disorders, et cetera, where you, those are ranked and then linked to the different hubs in the brain. That information can be then uh, transferred to a clinician uh, who uh, subscribes, for example, in the lower right, these are clinicians located in different parts of the world that receive this information from patients. They then arrange to, uh, for the patient to come into their office to do or to do it uh, to evaluate them remotely. That is, you can actually have an EEG set up, sent to the patient's home, and then using uh, the internet, uh, go to meeting, Zoom, uh, et cetera, you can evaluate that patient in real time to make sure they get, get good, good quality EEG. Uh, the EEG is only maybe five or 10 minutes is necessary. That EEG then is sent to the clinician clinician then can uh, work with that uh, patient to devise various treatments to move the brain towards greater stability and efficiency. The symptom severity of the line charts are shown in the upper right. Uh, then in this case, it happened to be an attention problem. That's where the, the, the larger bar is. Then uh, in the uh, QEG software programs, uh, one identifies the attention network and then uh, evaluates the hubs and the connections between the hubs of the attention network. And then the radar map uh, in, in the center uh, on the right, uh, it shows the severity of the symptoms decreasing as a function of treatment over time. So you repeat this in this circle and it gives feedback to the clinician and you, the goal is to reduce the severity of the symptoms and move the brain towards greater stability and efficiency. Uh, this software, uh, which is uh, relatively inexpensive and readily available. It can be downloaded from the internet. Uh, is an, as shown here as an example, it can be used on a tablet, a smartphone, a laptop, et cetera, uh, by a variety of different uh, individuals uh, to evaluate one's own brain or to evaluate, uh, let a professional evaluate the hubs in one's brain and to link symptoms. Now, this is a, an example of how uh, biofeedback or neurofeedback happens this is a streaming EEG on the left. The traces are coming across. Hopefully it's not too cloudy looking as can be seen. Uh, the networks of the brain are changing in real time uh, as they compare to a reference healthy database of individuals. And this allows the clinician now to look at both in two dimensions on the right, that's called the connectome or the three dimensional image of the brain that are the same hubs to uh, identify those hubs and connections uh, that, can, that one can use various treatments such as biofeedback to uh, reinforce greater stability and efficiency in those hubs. And this is actually the software we use, uh, the, 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 the criteria that typically the feedback signal is like a DVD or a, a sound or uh, a video that when the brain moves in the right direction, then the uh, feedback signal is activated that over time reinforces uh, greater stability and efficiency by changing the size and number of synapses, as Eric Kandel elucidated. This is a brief example of some of the scientific literature at the National Library of Medicine that is readily available for anybody to do a search on these various clinical areas with EEG in the search uh, line to evaluate the, the variety of uh, uh, publications and the science is really quite uh, mature now at this time. Uh, this is an example of uh, the changes in the, uh, the brain moving in the direction of uh, near to zero, which is the center of the healthy population, the reference population, uh, over sessions. And the top left is a patient that has dementia, and then the middle top is a child with attention deficit disorder, then a patient with post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, um, the traumatic brain injury. Uh, veterans, we have seven systems at uh, Fort Campbell 
uh, looking that in which soldiers in uh, Afghanistan uh, are uh, rehabilitated uh, with uh, PTSD and mild traumatic brain injury. We have 22 systems in McDill Air Force Base uh, as they help with special ops, which includes uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force. These are peak performers, but they have problems of various types uh, and can be moved in the direction of greater health by evaluating the organ that's related to their symptoms. These are just more examples. Uh, we have there's numerous publications on the use of uh, the biofeedback to change the brain in the direction of greater health, and um, this way you can you know, show this to the patient pre and post treatment and keep moving the patient in greater in the direction of greater health as well as evaluating the severity of the symptoms. Uh, these are some of the hubs that are involved in the uh, in Parkinsonism and, and balance disorders. The cerebellum is in the lower right. Uh, we use a method uh, called uh, S. W. Loretta, developed by uh, Ernesto, Dr. Ernesto Soler, who uh, works in our company, uh, that gives us the ability to get good accuracy of the sources in the brain, even those sources that are deep, such as the cerebellum, and at the top is the somatosensory cortex. This, this network is very important for uh, the control of movement. Uh, this is an example of a, a co-registration with the with MRI that's with the fusion tensor imaging. We change the colors of the uh, fibers. Uh, these are standard template fibers based upon the degree of connectivity, functional connectivity and effective connectivity. That's the, the rate of the direction and magnitude of information flow. Uh, so this helps um, uh, illustrate uh, which regions are deviant and which areas need to be moved towards greater stability and, and greater health. Uh, this is just another tool in the neuro navigator. One, one can navigate into these different hubs with different symptoms and different categories depending upon the patient's uh, problem. And uh, this is, happens to be the attention network, the dorsal attention network. Uh, the spheres are the uh, hubs. They happen to be what they call Brahman areas. Those are anatomically unique areas with special cytoarchitecture architecture that in which neurons will operate uh, synchronously and then communicate, communicate across uh, the uh, various uh, white matter fibers and connections that connect uh, the, uh, the, the hubs and the network hubs in the brain. And one can measure the, uh, the efficiency and e efficacy of the connectivity between the hubs as well as how well neurons get synchronized in the hubs. And then again, uh, use treatments to move the individual towards greater health. So thank you for watching.